Hi there, welcome to another Rahala Stepa this week with Pakalakadak Dak himself, Pakahontis, Jeremy Paxman. Now, this one was recorded uh, one week after I had had an orchidectomy. That's right. Um, my ball had been removed, and yet I still came out of my sickbed to record this for you. Am I a hero? I don't like to use the word hero. I like you to use the word hero because I'm a hero for doing this for you. Um, and, uh, you know, given the temperament of the guest and the host, you would think that uh, maybe it was the guest who'd had a testicle removed. But that, that's just that's just me. So um, I hope you're enjoying these and uh, they should continue as long as I can. I'm feeling very well and um, got a bit more treatment to come. But uh, I think I'm basically all right, kids. Um, and I will be back doing all the Twitch channel stuff as soon as I can. Twitch of Fun will return pretty soon, maybe this week, maybe next. We'll see how I'm feeling. And uh, Snooker should be back soon. And even stone clearing, who knows? Maybe I will clear some stones at some point. Um, head to gofasterstripe.com slash badges to become a monthly badger. You get lots of extras. You help us make more content. You can buy books and downloads there as uh, Go Faster Stripe as well, if you wish. Um... And uh, just keep on enjoying the podcast. If you can listen to them with the adverts, that is very helpful. If you can just spread the word to your friends about this amazing interview with Grumpy Packalackalack Dak 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 Dick. Uh, I love him. Jeremy Paxman. Sit back and relax, man. With Jeremy Paxman on Raha La Stapa. Sorry about the wavy background. There was nothing I could do. I'm living in a world of static. Please welcome a man. He's back from the dead. It's Richard Herring. Hello. Welcome to another episode of Richard Herring's Left Side Testicle Podcast. <laughs> I was um, I was hanging out with the incredible staff at the Lister Hospital in Stevenage. I never knew I'd be so grateful to people who would semi-castrate me, but I really am. Uh, they call it Rahalastaba. So, uh, yeah, I, uh, as you may have gathered from last week's show, uh, I told a to total stranger about my testicles uh, as the first thing I said to her. Um, I uh, I did have a, a ball removed last Wednesday. It's a week. I've been a week of being a a mono ball, a uniball. I'm trying to get sponsorship from uniball. I don't know if they'll go with that. Um, I've had a week in bed. Um, I've had no children, no childcare, no schooling. Been watching TV, playing video games, having all my food brought to me for a week. It's the best holiday I've had in six years. It's absolutely worth a testicle that that week. I'm telling you, I'm considering just taking the other one off. So I can make this a fortnight. Uh, we will see. Um, I, um, uh, I mean, that we'll, there'll be more about this as we go on. I'm not going to talk about it too much tonight. Uh, but uh, I got uh, there. You go. That's that's a nice graphic of that. I uh, got uh, some jock straps delivered this week because I need support for my uh, testicles, and uh, they arrived. Uh, there were three of them. They were the wrong size, but it was all right. They made they made them extra extra large, and it, I needed that. Even with even with a, th a third of my genitalia gone, I still needed that. Uh, uh, but they gave me some free gifts, which included a pair of ankle socks and some Despicable Me stickers that I hadn't asked for. Were just in the box. I don't know whether that's just a service the jock strap people do. That's my bum there, by the way, in the picture. That is me. It's a picture of no, it's how not. I look. <laughs> So that's a good emergency question coming up. What's the uh, what's the weirdest thing that uh, you've been sent by accident or that you didn't ask for? Um, and uh, uh, my my favorite thing my daughter's done this week is uh, she. Uh, oh no, there's that's some balls. More balls, balls. That's balls. Let's see if I've got it. Oh no, I haven't got the picture. Um, I'll do this one. Amazon uh, have uh, got into trouble because their new logo apparently looks too much like a Hitler mustache. Because Hitler famously had a blue moustache, which was all kind of... You can see from the picture next to Hitler there, it's exactly the same as the blue and with all bumpy stuff uh, at the bottom. Um, so they've changed that. I mean, I think... I, because I, people complained that they reminded them of Hitler uh, and it's now a sort of pl a sticker coming off a box. But that reminds me of Dr. Harold Shipman, 
uh, putting a plaster on something, taking it off, and then smiling while he's doing it. So Amazon are going to have to change. It's nothing like Hitler. Terrible people. Uh, and yeah, my daughter um, has started calling the Incredible Hulk, which she calls it the Credible Hulk, which I quite like. Uh, and I think uh, that I'd prefer to watch that. Uh, just a believable Hulk. It's sort of Lou Ferrigno, not green. Uh, if he, he can't jump off the top of a roof because he'll break his legs. I, I think it's a good idea. So we'll see how that goes on. Uh, we're about to find out whether my interviewing power came from my right testicle. Uh, hopefully it didn't. Uh, I don't want to laugh too much today because that, if I sneeze or laugh, that's, it still hurts down here. They, they go in through the abdomen, by the way. So it's it's not as bad as you might think. Let's introduce my guest this week. Uh, his oh my my wife also lost a tooth this week, so so we're, it's been quite. And my daughter lost a tooth, but that's not so bad. Uh, but I, I'm sure my wife was trying to steal focus from me. So she was my nurse, but then she was in too much pain and had to go and have her tooth pulled out. We're having a terrible time. We're getting old, getting very old. At least I hope we will. Anyway, my guest this week uh, is probably best known for being the fishing editor of Esquire magazine and appearing as himself in The Gay Daleks. That is why we're here. It is, it's Pakalakadakdak himself. It's Jeremy Paxman, ladies and gentlemen. There he is. He's, he's not quite in frame. Which way am I? That way, that way, that one. Hello, how are you doing? I'm very, very well, thank you very much. I've just worked out where the camera is, roughly. Good. <laughs> as long as you stay there, you look like a giant. We've had a lot of fun setting this one up. Uh, I'm predicting things will go wrong. Uh, but in the technical I should have terms. thought so. Yeah, what I wanted but, to know uh, is: Do you is there a ball fairy that comes along if you lose your ball and you get a you get a shilling or something? I asked the exact same, exact same question last week, and I didn't I didn't get to keep it because they have to take it away and find out what's wrong with it. I was very keen. I'm on Taskmaster, which is a Channel Four show. I don't know if you're aware of, and you have to bring oh, in unusual yeah, I watch prizes. It quite religiously, actually. Yeah, well, I was—I won the spoiler alert. I won the series I was in, so I'm going to do Champion of Champions if I'm well enough, and uh, I, that would be a good prize, wouldn't it? To so the first round prize, if you brought in your your own testicle, I'd give my right bollock to to win Taskmaster. I, I was—I tried to come up. I wanted to do like a joke, like just as I was going under anaesthetic, but it didn't seem appropriate. I was going to say something. I'd give my right bollock not to have to go through this or something like that, but it just never quite felt. Yeah, yeah, never felt just as well. You didn't use it. <laughs> It'll be in the sh in the inevitable show and book and the the beaut and podcast one pod podcast. I've got the, the problem is the doctor told me all this stuff and uh, uh, my mind's already racing. Going, oh great, I can do this. I can do that. You know, I've, as a comedian, you're just always looking out for uh, for what comes next. Um, do you remember being in the Gay Daleks, Jeremy? Do you remember your appearance in Gay Daleks? Uh, I, I don't, don't remember, remember that. that, but I, I'm uh, willing to concede it happened. I think it was just a voice. Voice. You wouldn't be allowed to do that now these days, Jeremy. It's 2003. No, no. I, now. At least I don't expect people to believe that a, a male model's bum in a jockstrap is mine. Well, it was mine. I can show you again. I'm wearing, I'm wearing a jockstrap now. I can show you the real thing. Maybe a jock. Yes, it'll be horrible. I don't think we want <laughs> to see that. Thank you very much. You probably don't want to see it. Um, well, it's lovely to have you on. We well, have met three nice times. You to ask me. No, well, it's love to have you. We've, we've met three times before. I was on, we were trying to work it out before. And we were, I was on Newsnight, I think, discussing offence in comedy. That's usually what happens. I was on an election special uh, where you talked to us very briefly. It was Steve Punt, Rebecca Front and me. And I, I did question why I'd been booked as part of that triumvirate, whether they just thought we can't find someone with the name that rhymes, but we'll get the next best thing. Uh, but my first meeting with you, you won't remember, uh, was in 1995. Uh, in a lift in BBC TV Centre, and I, I, before we were on TV, just going in for one of our first meetings, and I stood next to you and I touched your briefcase with my hand, and you didn't even see me. So there you go. So it's I'm, our fourth I'm meeting. beginning to think this is not an advised appearance. <laughs> well, I was going to say about you that you don't suffer fools gladly, so the next hour is going to be yeah quite interesting. Get on with it, you dolt. <laughs> You can't be rude to me. You're the, I'm not your. I'm the interviewer. You've got to be. We'll we'll get into we'll get into some stuff. It'll be fun. Um, I've been listening to your uh, audio book this week. I've got through the whole thing, twelve hours. You reading your own audio book, which is of your autobiography. That one. Oh yes, which is from a few years ago. But it's a very, I very much enjoyed it. I'm very glad you read it yourself. Well, I'm glad you enjoyed it. 
yeah, uh, I think yeah, I, what I liked about it is uh, you've got a very understated humour. I quite like the jokes. You, you throw the jokes away, and that, I like that. There's a joke where you uh, are driving to Tipperary, and you say it was a long way, but it's a th- it's a throwaway joke. It's very good. Um, I love the. I like that. It's it's interesting to hear you being uh, honest in a way that I suppose you couldn't be when you were working for the BBC and when you were on the, the news programmes. So the the chapters about uh, Northern Ireland, for example, where you actually sort of give your opinion <laughs> about who's in the right and who's in the wrong in, in Ireland, which is it's quite unusual to hear that, but it's quite actually quite refreshing to hear someone just give their honest opinion, which we don't really... I would go, we don't get the BBC, but you don't increasingly don't get it anywhere, really. Do you think? No, it's very rare someone goes. You talk about um, how most uh, uprisings, the the people doing the fighting are doing so because that's their last resort, because they've been driven to it, and you're sort of sympathetic to the to the the non UK side, I guess, the more than than you would have been on on the BBC. Was that refreshing for you to be able Keep to dig like in that? this hole? I'm enjoying it. I'm not. It's not. I'm not digging a hole. Uh, this is. It's. I'm digging a hole for you, if anyone. Um, is that? Uh, did you enjoy that with the book that you were allowed to sort of finally sort of state opinions rather than? I suppose so. Yes, lines? but I mean, I, I. You know, if we were having a conversation, that, that, that's the reason I want to do this podcast thing. Is because, you know, if you have a conversation, you've got to be yourself. You can't be anything else. Sure. And that's the same with the same with the book. If you're writing it in the first person, you've got to be frank. Yeah, and I can't see any point in in hiding your light under a bushel. But you wouldn't have been if you're still like employed at the BBC. You presumably you wouldn't have felt you could have written that book. You had to wait till it was till you'd sort of moved on. Do you think, or would you? I still... don't know. I'm not sure about that. Okay. Um. And also early on, the um, I think the the stuff about you being at boarding school is very interesting, uh, which is a life that I did not have, and I think most people don't have, but that most people who um, are rulers have had. Uh, and you didn't have a great time at school. No, I but, didn't like uh, it. No, but do you think that's? Do you think it, it sort of felt to me? It sort of not for you. I think it worked out quite well for you as a personality and what job you chose. But given that most of our the government sort of went through that similar experience of fags and uh, you know weird rules and being away from their parents when they're kids, um, do you think that sort of explains? <laughs> I just sort of wonder if those people are equipped to rule us when they and to lead us when they haven't really when they've sort of had this experience in childhood where love has been sort of not taken away from them, but certainly it's an, it's an odd experience, isn't it? I don't really buy that argument. I don't think it's true that all our rulers are from that sort of background. If you if you think about the people who we've had, we've had, who have we had? We've had Blair, Gordon Brown, Cameron, of course, was one of those. Yeah. But um, well, more Bor- recently, Boris is. But, you know... Rishi Sunak, I suppose, Chancellor of the Exchequer. Well, nearly, they're all from Eton now, aren't they? That's the. Well, Rishi Sunak the was at Winchester, wasn't he? Well, you know, it's all the same to the to us plebs. It's all the it's all. The same oh, do you deal. research, you lazy bastard? Yeah. <laughs> I'm saying, oh, I'm saying, generally speaking, they were all uh, public school educated people. They're, a lot of them are from Eton. Oh, you're now. I didn't have to research Rishi Sunak when I was got Jeremy Paxman. I've been. I've listened to your whole book. Who else? Do, you wouldn't have done that. You didn't do that when I came on Newsnight. What you want the whole book <laughs> reciting to you? No, I've, I've I've had it all recited to me. I lo- I love the fact that you do, I love having the author reading the book. Right, I think that's really great. Uh, you, you're a good performer. You're, we're just getting your ear at the moment, Jeremy. Oh, are you? <laughs> yeah. Right, good. Yeah. Well, it's I'll, like talking I'll, to my dad. I'll just slide on the, back like a drunk in the pub. Um, and um, is there anyone uh, you? Is there anyone from the past before audiobooks who you would like to hear reading their own audiobook? That's one of my emergency questions. So let's bring one out quickly. Um, God, you must be there, desperate. Like, must be desperate. You must be if you bring out emergency questions already. I know. 
Well, they're just we're talking about audiobooks is really all we're doing. I would have liked to answer have heard the question. Ian Paisley, answer the question, I'd, I'd Jeremy. I'd like to have heard Ian Paisley's audiobook, wouldn't you? You'd like to hear that? Let me I tell don't... you, friend. <laughs> I'm not sure it would keep you awake. A Let lot of me these books tend your to be breath. <laughs> You're not allowed to make me laugh. Actually, it's all right. I'm, I'm coping with the pain. Um, so in from your book, here's some things I've gleaned that I'm interested in talking about. You uh, shoot squirrels while sitting on your toilet. I want that you pass over that quite quickly. And I would like to, I, A, I can't understand how that's possible. And well, B, you've got to why turn do you turn around, of course. You turn around, so there's, there's yeah, an open not, window not behind you. crap, of course, but <laughs> just sitting on the loo. And yeah. if it's by the window... You sit, sit on the on the loo with the lid down, right? And, and you know, with an air rifle, you can pop pop off a squirrel or two. <laughs> okay, well, it seems un- a cr- cruel thing to do to the squirrels. Why is it cruel? Well, it kills them presumably or maims them. Doesn't do it much good. <laughs> are they annoying you, the squirrels, to, for you to do that? They or are it, annoying they me. Yes, yeah. they're always getting on the bird feeder. I, I mean, I love songbirds. And I can't stand the fact that squirrels are always driving them off and that they kill all sorts of things. They right. kill trees, for example. Entire trees are killed by squirrels. They're a menace. Okay. So you Some see yourself you as sort off. of the judge and executioner of the, for, their, for their squirrel crimes? I think so, yes. They poo on my car. That's what they do to me. So I'm happy for you to take them out, I have to say. If you want to come round to mine and shoot them out of the attic, you can do. That's uh, very but, good. Okay, fine. Have you got a loo I can sit on? <laughs> I forgot a car. I'm not sure there's one with a good view of where the squirrels are. But we'll find something. For you. I'm, I live in the countryside now. We'll find something for you to shoot. It'll be fine. Um, and um, uh, let me ask you a question about uh, the book now. Uh, well, there's loads of the like again. The John Gielgud story I thought was very interesting. So, as a as a reporter, you interviewed John Gielgud. There's a lot of things you sort of slightly skirt over, and I would like to know more about John Gielgud. You interviewed him at a theatre. Do you remember this story? And you, I do. Uh, yes, yes. It was at the Old Vic. Yeah, and uh, he arrived, and he was in his nineties or whatever. His it was very old. It was towards life. the end of his life. Yeah, and um, he or he is still he's he's dead, isn't he? I think he's dead. I think yeah. he's dead. Yeah, um, and he arrived, and and he was. He- I helped him up onto the stage, and we got onto the stage, and he said, um, "God, what's happened here?" Hello, You've gone you're... off. There's a J. It's all right. We can carry it. as long as the audio works. It does. Really. Oh, I see. Very good. Well, I, I've got a message from Vodafone that I have to give them some money. <laughs> God, it's annoying. Um, I can still hear you, so let's carry cool. on. Okay, and, uh, right, fine, we'll carry on. No, I helped him up onto the stage, and when we got onto the stage, he said, I wonder if there's a lavatory nearby. And uh, I then suddenly thought, Christ, I've just helped him up onto the stage. There's going to be no loo. And then I thought there must be one in one of the dressing rooms. So we went into the dressing room, and he said, um, I wonder if you could assist me. And um, I got the very strong impression I wasn't the first man to have held his cock. <laughs> he then... Well, I'd tell you, so do you think it was, did you feel it was a subterfuge on behalf of the, Sir John Gilgood to... No, it wasn't. It was, he was just, I think he just wanted to pee. Yeah. But then did the driver on the way home, he, he said that he had to stop six times for him. So it makes right. it, he said, it, he said yeah, what do you give you that feel... John Gilgood to drink? He said, I had to, I had to keep stopping on the M40 for him. <laughs> And um, I said, well, he just had a glass of water. But poor chap, you know, when you when you get old, you need to pee quite a lot. Yeah. But you don't usually ask someone to hold it for you. I mean, I think it's... it's There, you're back. Look, you're back. I am back, yes. <laughs> I pressed OK. There we go. It was as simple as that. Yeah. <laughs> it's, if, you put, if you put 50p in the meter, the internet meter to keep it going... Um, and well, there's a. I I genuinely think it's a it's a really good autobiography because you we we get opinions we get well you know because also I for a lot of people um uh, they're mainly aware of you from Newsnight so there's this whole career before Newsnight of of, of traveling the world and getting shot at and 
going to trouble spots, but then also working on uh, local TV and stuff. So um, what was the closest, you say? I mean, like a lot of it's a it's a very dangerous occupation, the the sort of war reporting and going to trouble it's spots. It's very dangerous, but I don't tell war stories because I just think it, I, it, it just switches the focus from whatever's happening wherever you are to me, me, me. And that's the besetting that's the besetting problem with television. It's full of vainglorious fools who want to be on telly instead of just letting the story tell itself. Sure. Um you do tell the stories in the book though, so you know I I, I would recommend it. There's some interesting stuff. So I mean there was there was that's good recommended recommended by a man with an impenetrable podcast. <laughs> But uh, so, you know, there was, you don't sort, because we've, and I, I'd forgotten that you were involved in, in the early breakfast television and uh, you'd obviously worked in uh, local TV in Brighton and in London as well, which I wasn't, I wasn't living in London that time, so I wouldn't have seen London Plus, uh, which sounds like I didn't necessarily miss a great deal. It, it was known as Sod Off Kent. <laughs> um, but... Uh, was that was that because that's a time when you know you you are crit critical of people uh, for wanting to just be on TV for the sake of being on TV, but some of those early jobs are not. Uh, I mean, some of them were very journalistically sound, obviously, and then something like working on the breakfast TV is a bit more of a celebrity job, isn't it, than a than a news job, maybe? Well, it was it was job. less that in those days, but right. um, yeah, I can see that. Yeah. <laughs> So as a young as a young man, you sort of did understand that part of it, and, and you know you obviously have to take work, and you obviously have to go where the work is. Yeah, but, uh, and you've got to learn that you've got to learn the job, haven't you, Richard? You do. That's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Um <laughs> you've got to keep going, and if you do it long enough, eventually you'll get better at it. We'll see. This is the uh, 319th episode, so. I don't There've been three hundred and nineteen uh, of these, something like that, yeah. And then a, there's more than that, really. I've done it a lot. Uh, it's you know, there's to look. It's like Les Dawson to uh, playing the piano. To look this incompetent, it takes a lot of skill. It's an awful <laughs> lot of skill. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll get there. That's how. That's how. That's how I, I'll. Uh, I'll. You'll uh, make mistakes. You know, I'll, I'll lull you into false sense of security. It'll be fine. Uh, but you are in the book. You're quite quite rude about news. You don't think news readers are, are, are you don't have much time for news readers. I think news reading is an occupation for an articulated suit. That's all. I can't see any <laughs> point in 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 reading the news at all. Reading aloud. Do you remember reading aloud at school? <laughs> that's what it is. I don't think it has any any grandeur or skill or anything to it. Yeah, Just any any can fool can do it. I mean, but that's true of a lot of jobs on TV, isn't it? A lot of jobs on TV are just sort of... Probably less. true of a lot of jobs full stop. Yeah, <laughs> that's probably true. So it's, but it is, I mean, I'm fascinated by that, the way that sort of fame, uh, you know, you become famous for certain things. I mean, I sort of think, you know, actors are sort of now the new nobility almost. And you sort of think when, when you think what an actor does as a job, it's it's fine, but it's not the most important job <laughs> world and yet they're treated as like you it's know, completely unimportant world. yeah reading somebody else's lines i mean it's you know what 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 an evanescently pointless thing to do it you know it's entertaining but I, what i don't understand is why those people then become you know get into the position where they can uh i mean some of them do become royalty uh yeah. <laughs> and then can treat people uh badly possibly but um uh, and I was, I was very, I, I like the honesty about the BBC because you clearly sort of love the BBC as well as having a, a Jeremy Paxman uh, style, copyright style disdain for a lot of it. But I, I um, think you, I think you have to decide: would the world be a better place if the BBC didn't exist? And I come down on the side of saying no, the world would not be a better place if the BBC didn't exist. But it is an immensely frustrating organisation. It's full of. It's full of, you know, boring people doing dull jobs and tr and pretending they're important. Whereas yeah. its true mission is just to make interesting programmes. Sure. 
But it's it's sort of I mean because it's been going for such a long time, and I think again you were there, so you've been there since the eighties, uh, maybe a little bit <laughs> earlier. I've been there since and 1922 so, but, or whenever it was. Whenever it was, but 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 it's sort of you you sort of a stand a stride the old days and the new days. So you've you a I think you look back and uh, on the old days and with you know thinking things were better in a lot of ways, but also that for example the uh, the story you tell about. Um, what what happens in the event of a royal death and all the kind of incredible stuff that you were for, supposed to go through, though I don't think anyone ever did go through it, is sort of unbelievable. That's right, it was absolutely absurd because it, the, the organisation was caught in this trap between recognising a news story and acting as mourner-in-chief and they got into a real muddle about it. So... You know, there were all these instructions issued about how you had to have a black tie and a grey suit and a white shirt. And these were all kept in a cupboard upstairs. And when the when the news came in that a member of the royal family had died, you were to continue acting perfectly normally, discussing the common agricultural policy or some rubbish, uh, and then to race quickly out of the studio run down the corridor, press the button for the seventh floor, get in the lift, get out of the seventh floor, run down the corridor, get into the uh, wardrobe, take out your jacket and tie and shirt, put them on, run back to the studio, and then say it is with deep regret the BBC announces the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. And, of course, we were all rehearsing for the death of the Queen Mother when, um, you know, Diana was killed. Sure, and that was, and then that was all caught on the hop. And Peter Sissons got a terrible amount of flack for announcing it while wearing a burgundy tie. Right, which was I just mean, ridiculous. A, why wasn't the wardrobe night next door to the studio? Why did they put the wardrobe so far away? Well, because um, because they, these decisions are not made by people <laughs> who actually make programs. But you, you can't. The idea of having to, you know, to change to deliver a person a piece of news is really important. And the BBC wanting to be the first to get in there, but then deliberately sort of scuppering them. So that would have taken surely ten or fifteen minutes for that to, to, to if you'd done. Did anyone ever did do about, it? It did, did probably take about ten minutes. Well, I lost my white shirt unfortunately because Robin Cook came in for a discussion about the European Union, and. Um, we had we had quite a distinguished cast. There were about a dozen people there, uh, including the Prime Minister of Latvia, the Foreign Minister of Slovakia, and various others. I've no idea who these people are, and nor did we have any idea of what their national flags were. So the the Prime Minister of Slovakia or Foreign Minister of Slovakia or whatever he was, sit down, sat down, and said, "Why am I sitting under the flag of Slovenia?" <laughs> and he's, sorry, it's purely symbolic. And Robin Cook came in and sat down. He was the he was the Labour Foreign Affairs, but maybe he was Foreign Secretary at the time. I can't remember. Um, and uh, he sat down, and the bloke who was putting the microphone on him knocked the cup of styrofoam cup of coffee he had all over his shirt. Robin Cook went absolutely bonkers and said, "I can't go on air wearing this coffee stained shirt." And so I said, well, you can have mine. So I gave him mine, uh, which, and I wore the, uh, actually, I think I gave him the, 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 Di, the Diana suit or the Queen Mother suit. And I never got it back from him. <laughs> Terrible thing. Are you the same? You're not this. You are, I mean, I, I don't know how big Robin Cook was, but you're a bigger man than Robin Cook, aren't you? You must have been. I am, but that's, that's good. If it had been too small for him, that would have been a problem, wouldn't it? <laughs> Well, I don't know. It's just like him being swamped, sitting like a. I was sort of. It's because of the spitting image puppet, I guess. I imagine him being like a little tiny gnome sitting in your giant's, in your Gandalf costume. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's um, like you in your pants. Yeah. Well, you you could you you, you I, I could be sitting in my pants. Well, you could all be sitting in our pants. That's the that's the beauty of. Uh, I am sitting in my pants. Good. I'm glad to hear it. Um. And then I didn't know this. There's a lot of stories I didn't know about you. Oh, let's talk, as we're talking about pants. Let's talk about pants. I did remember this when it, when it, when I got to it, but I'd forgotten about it. That you became a sort of uh, 
the crusader for men's underwear and uh, and and affected the shares of M&S by criticizing M&S underwear as being as falling apart too easily. Yeah, this was, this was very unfair. I mean, I've I've got a solution to this. That all underwear should be sold with a sell by or best before date on it. <laughs> Do you know how old your pants are that you're wearing now? I don't. Well, that I, it's interesting because the same People, thing happened to me. But then I wonder if it's partly to do with my I, I all the pants I have. Paul, I get Paul Smith pants, which is a terrible, uh, expensive way to get your pants, and they all started going through in the exact same spot. And like for about two weeks, I just had to throw away pants after pants. That they all started splitting at the same bit. But now I'm wondering if it was to do with my heavy ball that I've just had taken out was was rubbing against them, and that might explain it. But uh, yeah, they. I, I, there are certainly pants there that uh, uh, I've definitely got pants in my drawer that are a lot older than my marriage, which is uh, nine years. Yeah, that's very bad. Yeah. And if you ask anyone how old are the pants you're wearing today, they can never tell you. And the thing is that, Let like everything, they, they wear out. Yes. And if so they that wear was what out. The, at, having brought them and S to its knees, that's I, what you realised it wasn't really their fault. I don't think it was their fault, really. No. I mean, any kind... If you wear they, Calvin Klein, Paul Smith, anything, they all go in the end. Yeah. It's true. But, uh, you know, you made a big fuss about it. I didn't you make a big fuss to... about it. I sent a private <laughs> note to Stuart Rose saying, I've always been a fan of Marks and Sparks. And some twat published this. Right. <laughs> Well, is it what pants do you wear? Just do you wear M and S now, or have you moved moved on from M and S? Sometimes I wear M and S ones. I might be wearing M and S ones today. In fact, right. I've certainly forgiven them. Okay. It was very, very unfair that the way they were held up to public ridicule. <laughs> but then they took they took you out for lunch and sort of got their revenge by making you they did. Touch a, touch there a was man's pants. It was very funny. It was Stuart Rose <laughs> invited me to lunch, and we. There, there was a knock on the door, and through it came this man, this Dutch male model, uh, who said, uh, or rather Stuart Rose said to him, Hello, Remco. Now, those pants you're wearing, are they, are they self-supporting? And they were self-supporting. And then the key thing is, apparently in men's pants, it's do they have access Access means that they have a hole in the front for you to pee, for for you to have a pee. Yeah, uh, and some of these th thongy sorts of things he wore did not have access. But it was very embarrassing because he kept saying things like he was he was having a really good time. <laughs> Stuart Rose, who was the boss of M and S at the time, he said, um, "Do feel free to feel them." Now I don't know about you, but I've never felt another man's pants while he's wearing them. A John Gill, could you have? Uh, uh, no, not exactly. No, <laughs> I have. I don't think I, I have. No, but you know, it sounds like he was a good-looking young gentleman, so I'd have had yeah. a little feel. Would you? Yeah, definitely. It's, it's you know, sort of crosses it's, 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 a boundary. It's, 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 I mean, if it were Bethany Hughes, as I heard on your podcast <laughs> in her suspenders, I'd think differently about it. <laughs> Let's not get on to that. Um, uh, Why on earth not? I, I, I used to, I used to not understand the no access pants. Same we're on pants, Jeremy. But now I do. I thought how because I, you know, you have to pull them, pull them down like a child does. But I now my now I have that. Now I have all my pants. Uh, have you have to pull them down to be, to go to the toilet? Might be what might be why my testicles have gone awry. You they have to pull your pants air, down air to go to the loo. You have to put well if there's no hole. You have to just pull down the front to go to like. Do you remember when you were at school and you were five yeah, yeah, years old? Yeah. Do you remember how you could wee all the way up the wall, Jeremy? Can you remember how high you could wee when you were five? Oh, years old? happy days, eh? <laughs> Did you ever try and wee? We used to try and wee over the the wall in the primary school because there was like a yes. wall you could get it over the top. Can't do that anymore. But yeah, you just pull down, <laughs> pull down your pants. It's going well, isn't it? It's going well. Uh, and um, well, I'm so I don't, glad what, I decided did you ever get to, to the bottom evening. of what I was very interested in um, the story about the the mysterious package you received 
uh, that turned out to be um, a stolen enigma machine, enigma machine that someone had stolen. Did I ever get to the bottom of it? No, I think. Did you ever that... get to the bottom of why they sent it to you? Well, I think they just were reasonably confident that if it if it did come to me, although there was some buffoon in the management at the BBC who said, "Of course, there's a news blackout on this. We can't publicise it at all." I think if they, I think they thought if they sent it to me, I would at least say that I had received this thing, and yeah. it could, and that the thief could then prove that it existed because it had a key thing missing from a key element. One of the rotors okay. was missing. And uh, so I think that's what it was. I'm not right. sure. Because I'd have kept it. If that, so you, you're quite honourable in, in, in throughout. In and it wasn't accepting. mine to keep. Someone has stolen it. Yeah, but they, they don't, no one would know you had it. It had been lying in the office for two weeks already. You hadn't even opened the, the package. So it that is worked. true. Um, and so you could have got to, you could, you, the Dalai Lama gave you a toffee. It wouldn't, you were trying to turn that down because you were too principled to take a toffee. Yeah, and I did. I turned down a case of whiskey once from the Arab League. Wow! Yeah, I mean that was that was pretty tempting. I can tell you. <laughs> but I, I mean, when they sent me Shergar, for example, <laughs> didn't have to begin to smell after a bit. <laughs> Could have your own little museum of all these people. It's it's a it's an odd thing to, to receive. It's uh, the receiver code of stolen machine. goods. Yes. Yeah, but. Uh, Okay, I'm going to ask you. I'm going to go to some emergency questions. People are very excited about the emergency questions. I'm going to ask you, and uh, so I'm going to have to do a few, and we'll see how they go, and then we'll go back to your uh, podcast. And you, with, look, time's flying by. Um, if would you rather, Jeremy Paxman? It's an important question. Would you rather have a hand made out of ham or an armpit that dispenses sun cream? A hand made out of ham or It's a... a simple question, Mr. Paxman. Would you rather have a hand made out of ham or an armpit that dispenses sun cream? Answer the question. I'd rather have a, uh, an armpit that dispenses sun cream. Okay, good. Thank you for answering the question. <laughs> Where do you get um, these have... bloody stupid things from? Well, I, as you say in your book, it's sometimes it's good to disarm people with uh, a question they haven't been asked before and then find out. Where it goes, but I thought it'd be funny. Well, if you I've honestly to never that. been asked that. Yeah, that's what. I, that's that's you know. And then we get some new stories. Have you ever seen a ghost, Jeremy Paxman? I don't. I don't believe in ghosts, but I think no. I'm. I think I felt one once <laughs> when I was staying in a house in Ireland. Yeah, and I felt this very cold presence when I walked down the stairs in the middle of the night. I felt this very cold presence brush past me, right. and I thought that must have been a ghost. Or, you know, some wind. Or a bit of wind, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That can or, cause you a lot of trouble. <laughs> or just a cold bit in the house. Could be that. Uh, could be. What do you think happens? Uh, you were asking, uh, I was listening to your podcast where you were talking to Michael Palin and being a bit rude to him, but he he took it well. Um, I wasn't and rude And you asked him. him. You were saying, when are you going to start? You're too old to go around the world, you were saying to him. You were, you were being very cheeky to him. It was with love, but... Uh, uh, he'll say, "You are not going to be going around the world when you're 96." He might do. He's a good. He's a good man. Um, he's a good man. You I asked like him, him about what? Yeah, he is a good man. What's your um, point? We can agree on that. Well, you were asking him about what he thought happened when he died. What do you think? What do you think happens when you die, Jeremy? Have you got any any thoughts about what's coming next? I I don't it's know. I wish I, it would be very interesting to know if there was something coming next. But um, I think when I die, my body will rot. I think that's all. Mm. That I mean, I'm I'm with Bertrand Russell on that. Yeah, I well, I agree. I think like having it's interesting going under anaesthetic and the way you just sort of turn off, and then you get turned back on again, don't you, with the anaesthetic? But basically, you're sort of gone, and it's you're just gone. And I assume that's what death's got to be like. Because I otherwise... suppose so. Yeah, although you don't wake up with a bit less of your body. <laughs> well, you wake wake up with you don't wake up at all, and all of your body's gone. If you wake up and you're, they're burning you, yeah, I'm glad. I was glad to have the anaesthetic. They offered me um, like a spinal local anaesthetic for it, and I couldn't think of anything worse than watching your balls be cut off. Away. No. Pardon? Watching your balls be cut off? No, I yeah, I mean, be... I would. I, I I look away if they're putting needles in my arm. You know, I I can take it, but I I don't like to look at it. 
So the idea of even just being, I, I can't imagine that you would, the, the psychological damage of sort of even being aware, awake, even if you're looking aware, you know, you know what's going on. It was just so wonderful to be able to, to you know, they didn't even count backwards. I was just out and then I was awake again and then it was, and everything was over. So I was very impressed with it. Very, very good. The NHS are very good, aren't they, Jeremy? Do you like, did they you are like the great. I like, I like the NHS. Yeah. Yeah. I think good. it's great. And I'm rather proud of it. Yeah. Well, they've done, you know, that's, you were saying you'd had an accident and, they, and they'd saw you very quickly recently before we got into the uh, podcast. And, you know, just with everything that's going on at the moment for them to be, you know, they were so cheer, nearly everyone, I'd say 95% of people just so cheerful and 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 professionally cheerful. They're and, wonderful. And, yeah, so it was, it was very good. But, um, right, well, let's talk about the podcast. So the, the, it's been going for a little while and it was so obviously conceived pre-lockdown but you've managed to keep it going through lockdown because the idea is uh that you go to a, a pub and chat with someone you want to chat to rather than someone that has been put in front yeah, of you. yeah i just you. was sick of having to interview people about politics night after night after night and you know those things there are there are uh, in, in an immediate tussle to establish the terms of engagement and so you start and you've got to you've got to get them on the back foot pretty early on. Sometimes you can do that by attacking them from the left when they're expecting an attack from the right. Sometimes humor can help. All sorts of possibilities. But I just thought it was rather pointless in the end. It was a dialogue of the deaf. And so I just thought well, it would be nice to talk to people who you really wanted to meet, who had things to say and to do it over a pint too would be jolly nice too and then <laughs> so we got about three i think three of these conversations over a pint in, under our belt and then we had to carry on doing it remotely over this ridiculous thing that you've got here <laughs> well given you're doing it remotely you don't seem to have mastered the technology at all which is 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 good to see so congratulations on that and see, but i found it you no know, i i like what i love about my podcast is it's in front of an audience usually and it's live and you're with the person but i have found doing them online interesting in a different way have you have you found it still works as a i don't as find it at person? all interesting i find it really frustrating <laughs> what is your like, what, is, what is your point <laughs> I well, I think there's different things about it. I like your podcast because the intro is just loads of you saying, "Oh, this has gone wrong. What's going? On? I can't. I can't remember what's happening here. What's it's it's turned off." Uh, so that's good fun. But I know I think there's a there's there's a sort of intimacy to an online conversation as well. I've I've found them. You know, this has been like my for me. This has been like my little social uh, social life is on a Wednesday. I'll talk to somebody for an hour, and you then I'll go back shadow. to looking after my kids. You are a really sad man, Richard. Oh, I, am. I am. So this is your social life. Yeah, but I don't. I don't. I'm not that bothered about going out anymore. I've got two young kids, and it's, you know, I'd rather just sleep if I can get the chance. But it's. But it, there's there's a sort of sleep, different energy it? if you're doing something in front of an audience, which is what I usually do. Then obviously people play up to the audience a little bit, which can be good. But um, I think off, doing it online, you can sort of forget that it's. This is real sometimes. You can forget that it's going out sometimes. And so I think you can get into quite interesting Certainly you can forget this is going out. <laughs> I don't, I don't. <laughs> it's going out live. Are both people, your listeners tuned in? We've got actually 347 people watching at the moment, which is pretty high for uh, 347? For yeah. That's very good. Yeah, How do you know, you know so precisely? We... Are they sorry? How do you know so precisely? Because there's a little counter there. It's actually not that. It's 377. The people at home have got a better counter than me, so it's nearly 400 people. That's that's very good for for live. And then tens of thousands of people will, well, hundreds of thousands of people will listen to the podcast, and tens of thousands of people might watch the podcast on YouTube. They'll have a great time with this one. They will. <laughs> they will. This is one made for video. Um, but. Uh, you know, this has happened. I've been doing podcasting for like 12, 13 years or something like that. Have you? I've only just that, started. I'm a novice. Give me some I tips. I know. Well, the, the, all you TV people coming in and getting in, in my patch. All right. Give me some tips then, mister. <laughs> yeah, I was going to get you to give me some tips. Well, you, you know, you, you don't need any tips. It is exactly that. It's the conversation. It's trying to 
it's trying to find a, an interesting way into talking about something that people haven't talked about, I think, isn't it? I don't know uh, about much. you, but it seems to me that the great pre-requirement for our job is to be curious. Sure. And if you're not interested, if you don't naturally ask, why is it like that? That reminds me of such and such. If you don't naturally think that, then you're in the wrong job. Yeah. I'm just, I, I find people endlessly fascinating and I, I, I love talking to them. Well, it's nice as well. And this is what I like about what well, A, the podcast, as I think you've discussed, you, you know, you're in control of it, you're deci- but also you're deciding who the guests are. And booking the guests can be a pain in the ass, and I appreciate the good work bookers can do. But also, you're getting people that you actually want rather than someone saying, "Oh, you know, uh, that you're interested in." And pretty much everybody I've ever had on is someone that I've I'm at least I've thought there's, I want to talk to them because I'm interested in this or or, or that. But um, yeah, so you know that that element of it, the element where obviously you're not getting paid a million pounds a year to present this podcast, presumably, Jeremy is uh, no, I'm not, not getting good. paid anything. No. Just do it out of interest, don't you? Yeah. Uh, well, I did to begin with. I'm starting to get paid for it now after 14 years. But it's, um, yeah, I, well, I, but also I just think it's, yeah, it's a good way of getting stuff out. I'd rather the things existed. For me, it was just, it was the same frustration. I think being a comedian and being a journalist have a lot of, a lot of uh, similarities. And, and, you know, I was frustrated with... Uh, having to try having to jump through hoops to get stuff onto tv and radio and just the ease of being able to go okay well i've got an idea and i think you know you get to a point don't you when you think i know more about what makes good tv or radio than someone who's 30 years younger than me who's just started a job who's deciding what goes in so you know i think it's nice to be able to prove that and be able to come and do god you're sounding like a real old fart Well, I'm 53. You're, I, I'm, I find it hard to believe, Jeremy. But are you, you, are you now 70? I am 70. Yes, 70. Very, years old. very old. Very old. <laughs> I well, might I hope not I get off to any 70. moment. You could, but you could also go on for to, to you could be doing a wee with someone holding your penis in a theatre in 23 years. So, well, that's, still, that, that's an aspiration devoutly to be wished for. There's something to look forward to, but. Um, yeah, it's uh, well, you know, but it's. I think it's it's. I, I like getting. I want to get old. Um, this this uh, recent emergency has, has made me think about not getting old, and then suddenly you go, oh, you know, I was quite looking forward to getting old. So I hope that happens. I'm confident. It will. You know what I think is great about getting older? Go on. What you don't have to give a monkeys. <laughs> you don't have to care what people think about you. You don't have to worry about being. Yeah, polite. You just have to be yourself. Did you ever worry about that, <laughs> Jeremy? Were you ever worried about being polite? I think I was, actually. <laughs> I am still say please and thank you, of course. <laughs> but um, I don't... I think it's just great not to have to care about what people think. Yeah. Well, I think that's you the sort of that's I the disease am. of the young person is that. I mean, it's, and for me, I was I was so self conscious and so worried about doing the right thing that it absolutely stultifies you, and you know you don't do anything because you're too scared of how what people will think. And so it is wonderful to leave that behind and know, yeah, I'm just going to crack on and see what happens. Um, well, even as a comedian. I- yeah, yeah. I mean, I think on stage was where the only place I could sort of slightly do it. But even so, you were still self, you know, you're worried about, you know, not getting any more work, doing it wrong, not being good. So it's very hard to enjoy it in the early days in the way I do now. But um, but it's in socially speaking, I was I was very uh, awkward and socially insecure as a in, right through my 20s and 30s, really. It was really only was about 35. I sort of started sort of getting over all of that and thinking what why am I wasting my time you know when the thing is like you worry about the, that worry about what people will think and the, the the truth is they're probably not going to think anything I don't really no one really cares that much so it doesn't unless you're doing something absolutely terrible it's going to get forgotten anyway so it's tell me but, do you, you know, call this do you call this comedy this show yeah. I do I think this is I think this is um spontaneous uh, chat and I think it usually is pretty funny yeah so you're being very funny Jeremy and uh, and it's it's sort of a, well, I think we'll let the whilst, audience judge that 
we'll let them decide. But whilst we're, I, mean, I can talk, talk about you. You're being funny, and I think it's sort of, it's sort of uh, not quite a pastiche of an interview show, but it's uh, I'm I'm breaking the rules of interview sh- an interview show, so I'm doing it in a comedic way. But also, I love this show because it will usually usually at about the forty five minute point where we are now then we'll suddenly talk about something serious anyway, because it just, even if you've got a comedian who's being funny and funny and funny, you'll get into some interesting discussion about something because that's the way conversations work. So I think that long, being it long form, it gives you the, it gives you the freedom to be funny. And and I'm starting off trying to be funny, but I think it also gives you the freedom to um, open people up. And that's what this, what this is why my one works. And I'm sure your one works in the same way. And for what I've listened, it does listen to, it does is that you, you get people talking and then, if you're having a nice time, they'll they'll sort of start saying stuff that they'll they relax, would. yeah. <laughs> and it's and it's that relaxation that's the fun of it. And I think if if you've if you've got comedy in there, that's good. And I think you know, but your style is still quite comedic. You're you're it's the character of Jeremy Paxman, which might be the real Jeremy Paxman, but this you know this uh, disdainful <laughs> sort of slightly superior uh, character who will Get question everything. It. A little bit snide, but likable. But it's a funny character, and so you're you're a comedian as well, I think. But comedy's hard, you know. I, well, I, you've I, done the Edinburgh Fringe. I know you've done the Edinburgh Fringe. I, I did do the Edinburgh Fringe, and I found it really terrifying. Hmm. I found it completely awful. I didn't enjoy it. Well, the Edinburgh Fringe is the least enjoyable place to do comedy in lots for lots of ways. I like I've been a lot and I do like it a lot, but it's it's a hard place to have a have a good time because of all the various pressures going on. But I think it's always but it's the same thing. It's the, it's the same as anything in that you've just got to, uh, you know, you've got to sort of believe enough that you just get on with it. And and, you know, I think you I think I would I didn't see that show. I don't think I was in Edinburgh the year you, you did your show. Um, it didn't miss unusual. much. <laughs> what? Wait, you had a you had a wheel. I understand you had a spinning wheel with. I had a big, on it. a big wheel with uh, with subjects on it, and then yeah, I think the audience could spin the wheel, and I I can't recall what happened. <laughs> I blotted it out. It was too horrible. Did people come and see it? Is that the, did did you get good audiences, or was it? Was oh, that well, the... there was the place was full every night, but it was um, I didn't enjoy it. I just felt too nervous, and I'm not naturally a comedian. I'm not naturally a, a performer. I see. I think you are, but I think it's under it's understanding what your clown is. I think in terms of, and I uh, guess you know you're a, as a comedian, you're a sort of straight comedian, but you're the sort of the straight man. But there's it's that you know it's the it's the wink beneath it. You're winking at it, aren't you? When you're when you're doing an interview, you'd sort of. What's interesting, I think, and again, from your book, what's interesting is that as a journalist, you sort of know, you've got a good idea of what's going on behind the scenes and what the what the politician usually is not telling you. You know why they're not telling you it and you know what the truth is and you know they're not going to tell you. And so that's a sort of little comedy dance of of you trying to wheedle something well, that, out of Michael yeah, that, Howard that, or whoever. That is one way of looking at it. But um, <laughs> I found, I just found it completely terrifying. Yeah, it is, but it, you know, it's an it's an unusual thing to want to, but so is any sort of form of being in public and talking in public. But yeah, it is. Don't you find? You, I mean, what what happens to your sphincter when you walk on stage? <laughs> it's fine now. I went I, when I was young, when I did the uh, student reviews, I'd go to the, I'd have to go to the toilet about four times, like before each show. Um, but now it's. Um, I, I can walk on. If you just said, you, I mean, even now we're, we haven't been on stage for a year. If you just said you're on stage now, go on. I would just be able to do it. But it's, it's, um, you know. But it's, it's. You've got to really want to do it, and you've got to go through some horrible experiences in order to get there. So any comedian, uh, and some of them claim not to, but I think they're just deluding themselves. You'll have I had so many see bad worth it. early on. I can't see it's worth it. What's the sati- the satisfaction is hearing people laugh, isn't it? Oh, it's great. It's fantastic to making people laugh. It's it, well, it's a pow- it's a powerful feeling, and that's why a lot of comedians turn crazy and get too arrogant. I think because when you've got a re- you you're in control of a room full of people, and when you get it really right, you've got them in pain with laughter, and you know you've got something funnier coming up, and so that that sort of 
power. I mean, I just, I mean, it's, I feel, my wife says this about me as you know, and, and I think I, I like on stage, I'm like a different person and I feel like I'm like I'm properly alive on stage, which I am off stage as well, but it's, I'm, a, I'm not at all, at all like it off stage. And so if I don't perform for a bit, I'm, I become a bit of a nightmare though. I've been a bit better in the last year or two, but also I just, there's something, something turns on that, um, that just really, really enjoys that experience for some reason. Not always. Sometimes it's when it's bad, it's horrible. Yeah, when it goes wrong, it's a, it's an awful thing. But I love the, I love the risk of it, and that's increasing. That's why I like this doing podcasts because they're I, you know I don't I do I'll make sure I've done the research. But you don't often none of the research ends up being in the show. Uh, but then you're creating something out of nothing. But also it can go you know I, the stuff I've been doing online over the lockdown. A lot of it's kind of quite high concept and weird and is a risk but then almost without an audience but as we are now we don't know what the audience are thinking about this and that's quite liberating as well because you just go okay let's, uh, you know. well you just crack on with it. so i'm doing a ventriloquist show and the first time i did it which was improv an improvised ventriloquist show and i've never learned how to do ventriloquism and um the first time i did it there was a couple of moments you think oh god this is just weird but like people like it and I like it and it's getting better all the time and you're finding, you're discovering stuff. And I think that that's the best way of writing is to do it on stage and that and discovering a, a comic, discovering something funny on stage that you didn't know was coming is is the best, I think. It's, it's just, that's that's a, a God, incredible yeah. thing. But, yeah, that, but that's the same as surely, you know, your, your prep for an interview with a politician or whoever and then something will occur to you or, you know, something falls into your lap or... Or someone doesn't answer in the way you expect them to do, and then you've got to improvise around that. So you're you're doing all the same job. We're doing the same job and the same thing. We it's are, just, and, uh, and I find one of the most frustrating things is listening or watching an interview when the interviewer just goes on to recite the next question on their notepad. Sure, uh, and you and very often they've already been answered. That 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 question's already been answered, and. I just found myself screaming at the radio or the television. For Christ's sake, he's already answered that. <laughs> but it's it's listening. You've got to listen and be thinking about. It's it's a complicated thing, right? So it's it's it. You've it's not got that to, complicated. Well, you've got to listen and know where you're going. It's next. just a conversation. So it, it, it's complicated to the extent of of that. And so if you you've got the main thing is to listen, right? So if you, that, that's exactly and it, but I've seen that with. When you interview my students, they'll come in with a pad and then they'll just go, they'll be shaking and they'll just go, right, and then they'll read the question and yeah, <laughs> they, poor they're things. clearly not listening and then just read the next question. So it's a weird thing to happen to a, for a professional to, for that to happen. Yeah. Poor thing. Anyway. See. Yeah, go on. <laughs> give me an emergency a, question. I'll give you an emergency question just to prove how that works. Um, I'm going to ask you a new one. What this is a new one. What is the most unusual uh, free slash mistaken item you've been sent in an online delivery? I got some Despicable Me stickers with uh, some jock straps. Have you ever had anything delivered incorrectly? I've never had any jock straps delivered to me or Despicable Me stickers. <laughs> I'm afraid. Have you ever had anything else wrong though that you ordered something and something else turned up? Well, there was a little gift. I mean, you've had an Enigma machine. I suppose that's quite I an suppose unusual. That, yeah, that's quite an unusual one. <laughs> I can't think. I, no, I was just thinking actually about the ridiculous emails you get. There was one I just received about a man who chopped his penis off because he was told he had to, too many lustful thoughts and he thought he yeah. was going to enact the biblical injunction to cut cut off whatever offends you. Right. Um, and, you know, I get lots lots of that sort of rubbish all the time, but I can't... Terrible, this uh, shortage of necks of kin in West Africa, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, it's just awful. All these people with no known relatives. I think we should set up a farm and send people out there to act as their next of kin. Yeah. Well, you know, it's worth worth signing up for you. There's a lot of money in it, apparently. Um, do you get, you get quite a lot of saucy messages as well or certainly in the book you mentioned a couple of you sort of skirt over a little bit but there's that yeah, sort of sex symbol version of uh of you that uh my wife didn't see it. i said he's a very sexy man my wife said uh, she didn't see it and i said well you're wrong he's very sexy 
I have no idea what my wife's not about. interested is what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a stay away, matey. Yeah. Did did you did, did you find that happening a lot with it with with the guests a little bit? You talk about a baroness who tells you she's not wearing any knickers and gives you a hotel details. But yes. were, were you were you sort of hit on a lot in the in the news? Not very you know? often, unfortunately. <laughs> I mean, you know, do you want to be hit on by John Selwyn Gummer or someone? <laughs> At the moment, you know, I've got to take it where I can get it. <laughs> That's just because you've got one ball. It'll, it'll got... be all right. Don't worry. Okay. No, I, only John Selwood Gummer will have me now. I've only got, I haven't got a complete set of genitalia. That's what that he's he's fine about that. What about you? Went for lunch with Lady Di, and it turned out to be just you and Lady Di. Was that was that a romantic overture from Lady Di? I don't think it was. I think she was just a bit lonely. Right. I think she she just used to invite people for lunch because she didn't see people. It's rather like us in lockdown, you know. Yeah, yeah. And did you you said it was you didn't really have much in common with her, but that, so you literally got invited to lunch. It was just you and her, and you had to sit there eating. Yeah, yeah. Quails or something. Well, I can't remember what it was we ate. I suppose I should remember that, but I do remember yeah. there were two a couple of. Very gay butlers who lifted up, uh, went in for synchronised uh, <laughs> lid lifting yeah. on these two plates that we had. But I don't remember what we ate. What was beneath the lid? <laughs> is that, is that do you, you don't seem to be particularly excited by celebrity. and but, but you Certainly not. It seems no. to me the evanescence of nothing. I mean, who was it? Was it Frost who said a celebrity is someone who's famous for being famous? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, but I mean, so, but so you've met a lot of people who are, you know, are very accomplished. And I've met a lot of people. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> I have. And you get to mix in those circles, and you get, in, you sort of get to. It feels like you you want to maintain this outsider uh, image, which is correct, I think. But you still get to go inside and. Step inside the citadel and see all these people and dine with them and that's get true. Whisk, that's right. I've been very, very fortunate in that respect. Yeah. Very fortunate, and I don't suppose that it would um, automatically happen if I hadn't had the sort of career I've had. But yeah, you know, it's pointless to take it seriously. <laughs> And you seem to have a lot. You seem in the book. You seem kinder to Boris Johnson than to Tony Blair, for example. You seem to, although you have some good things to say about Tony Blair, you do. You do say at one point that he's. You, you compare him to who do you compare him to? Um, you mentioned some people who've who've been disgraced. It might be Jonathan, oh Jeffrey Archer, and Tony Blair get discredited. You called Tony Blair discredited. Uh, which is quite a h- I think harsh... He, I think he is a bit discredited, isn't he? I mean, that war in Iraq was a disgrace. Yeah. We were we were led up the garden path on that. It was really shocking. And if you're inclined to believe people who say that they should be believed, then it's perfectly reasonable, I think, to say, I'm very sorry, you've let me down. Sure. It was an interesting decision because he he seemed so um, everything he did he seemed so concerned about what the public would think about him until that point, and then yeah. he didn't seem to care about that one thing, and that made me think that either he knew something we didn't know, or there was he was being you know there was something he, uh, right, he, he had all that power and and he had all that that momentum behind him, and he could have sort of done anything, and he was a bit cautious, I think, he, in the beginning, and then the Iraq War was not cautious. And not popular. No, it wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, and I, I suppose one should admire him for that, for flying in the face of public opinion. But, but uh, I don't. No. I'm afraid to say that I think that it was uh, he should have listened to people. But Boris Johnson, you may have given his first TV job as well, so as well as being you. You think he's quite a, a good company, at least. Oh, he's amusing company. He's an amusing company, but I, I did give him his first TV job. He was, the, he was, I think, the Daily Telegraph's person in Brussels. And I just said to the then editor of Newsnight, 
let's get this bloke in Brussels on. And first, uh, it was about corruption in politics. And um, one of the people who was on with him was, uh, I think it was Gaia Savadio, the Italian journalist. And uh, I said, Gaia, do you know Boris? And she said, oh, yes. He used to be my son-in-law. <laughs> it was very funny. <laughs> so it's your fault then, basically. You you gave Boris Johnson a TV career and promoted his anti-Europe and European ideas. So everything that's happened comes down to... See, to I don't ultimately. think that's a fault. See, I don't think having anti-European anti -European Union ideas, which is not the same as anti-European, of course, Mm -hmm. I don't think that's that that's a fault. I didn't say it was a fault, although I I'm not sure I agree with you. But uh, uh, I know. Well, well I know you did say it was your you fault. Did, you did. Um, you did well in the book. You talk about doing a program about uh, about the, about sovereignty uh, and being told that that would cost the the uh, Remain campaign five hundred thousand votes, which was all it took. That if the five hundred thousand votes had gone the other way. Uh, then we'd be remaining. people aren't so, that stupid. I think people can work it out for themselves. Do you think so? I'm not you've sure. Got, that. You've I'm got not, to act that on that just... basis. You've got to act on the basis. Yeah, you, you don't think there are people sitting here watching you, Richard Herring, make cheap points about <laughs> Brexit, and they say, "Oh well, I'm going to vote differently next time." I don't think that, but I think Jeremy Paxman, they might do. Why? I also think. It was too. I think it's too complicated an issue for for people who really think about stuff. I think it was. It shouldn't have been. We should never have been asked about it. Whatever, well, regardless of the truth stupid, of what's right are we? It came down I, to a very simple issue. And if you if you're saying we're too stupid as the people of this country to make a decision, then I say nuts to you, matey. <laughs> I think it's too complicated an issue to go yes or no on. That's all. I just think it there was it was there was too much going on. I think your your analysis in the book of why of, of why it happened and and why it went that way is is spot on. I think in that um, I think the the campaign was the Remain campaign wasn't wasn't good enough and, and it was um, and, you know they didn't focus on the right things and it was it was too difficult to sort of you know like you say I think people were goaded into being made to feel stupid and so they they went they they said fuck you i don't think they were goaded into making making such a sort of apocalyptic decision well a little bit i mean i think it was it, i think the, that feeling of being treated uh with disdain by a metropolitan elite i think that i think that's uh i think there was a feeling of there was there was a feeling of that yes and you know when we when we get down to it Aren't you and I part of that metropolitan elite? I wish I was, but I think you are, yeah. <laughs> I think you are. <laughs> you sit there in your red T-shirt in your <laughs> fake resuscitation room. <laughs> if this was a real resuscitation room, then I think I'd be in be in the uh, the elite. Yeah, I mean, we are, you know, yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, we're, both you and I, especially you, have very charmed and lovely lives, <laughs> and uh, yeah. But so, yeah, it's well, it's it's interesting stuff. But I'm going to blame you for. Uh, for well, I'm going to blame you, Mister Oxford man. <laughs> I worked my way. I didn't go to boarding school. Went to the Kings of Wessex School in Cheddar. Worked my way up, and and I, I was told that the the BBC guys won't employ people who went to Oxford now. So that so it's actually. I can't get any of my stuff on t on the BBC because they won't have they won't let anyone who went to Oxford, which is fair. Maybe enough. that it's not very good. Have you thought it about that? It might be, but that's not what I was told. I think it's fair enough. Bring in some different people. I've done enough. I've done enough rubbish. I think you have. Um, <laughs> I'm going to let you go in a second. Uh, it's been very lovely, very lovely to talk to you. Uh, we haven't been... even talked about University Challenge. Which, no, we uh, haven't. You're the longest serving quiz host of any program in the. World or in the UK? I've no idea. <laughs> I read that somewhere that this that which you've been doing that for a, a good long time though, right? It's, Twenty five years, it's, long time. Is it? Yeah. My goodness. Um, because I remember. Well, it's interesting that you wouldn't. You weren't going to do it because they didn't ask. That you thought they hadn't asked Bamba Gascoigne, and then 
you bumped into Bamba Gascoigne and you said he didn't want to do it. So that's why you ended up doing it. That's right, yes. Chance meeting with Bamba in, a, in the, the British Library. That's right. You've got a good memory, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, um, uh, he, that's exactly right. They, they approached me and said, would you like to do it? And I, and I said, well, you should really ask Bamber. It's his show. And then there was a lot of crap about how the zeitgeist had changed. And I said, well, I still think you should give it to him. And I bumped into him in the reading room in the British Library or British Museum, as then was, and um, said, look, you know, Granada are thinking of bringing back University Challenge. You should get in there. And he said, oh, yes, they asked me about that months ago. <laughs> what was absolute <laughs> crap about Zeitgeist? <laughs> he asked me about that about months ago. But I, I don't want to do it. It's too much like hard work. Well, there you go. So and are you finding it hard work or are you, are you just still enjoy it? I enjoy it. it. I enjoy it. I yeah. like students. You know, I, 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 you must remember what it was like to be a student. I do. Well, I feel like I still did. am, but time's passed by quickly. It, uh, it does pass very, very fast. It does. Uh, and that's a real old person's observation, of course, <laughs> that, that time passes quickly. But um, I like students. I like the fact that, they, that, that they're that they enthusiastic. I, I'm amazed by what they know. I'm amazed by what they don't know sometimes. But I know well, it's I still know. very hard. I mean, I think you say in the book it's harder than it, people say it's easier than it used to be. But you're but you're it's claiming it's harder. harder than it used to be. It's much harder than it used to be. But they're very hard. I I like. I've been asked. I didn't, I couldn't do it in the end. I was asked to come on the you know the the one you have where you have people come back and uh, do yeah, some the celebrity ones, version. The ones it. whose vanity is greater than their common sense. <laughs> I think it's too hard. I wasn't like falling over myself. I've done mastermind and I've done uh, different things. But I think university challenge is so hard. But the questions are easier on that uh, on that yeah. celeb special. Yeah, they'd have to be because no one would answer any questions. They're very that's it's, right. It's very yeah. specialized knowledge. Well, it's great. So that's is that going to carry on forever? You're going to be. I don't know. It's of... going to carry on forever, but it's going to carry on for a little while yet. <laughs> and the podcast and is what else is? Is there anything else on the horizon for you? Is there more books? Oh, I love writing books, yes, although yeah. I, I, I love that. I, I've actually lost four chapters of my latest book uh, today. I don't know where they oh. are. They're somewhere, in, um, they're somewhere in cyberspace, I think. Oh, no, that's a disaster when that happens, and it still happens. However much you back up, it still does happen. Four chapters, that's quite impressive amount of stuff to lose. It is, and they're not even consequential chapters <laughs> or sequential. <laughs> They are consequential, but they're not sequential. But uh, okay. they're, um, you know, I, I, there we are. That happens. Do you think you're going to find what's the what's the book about? Are you allowed to say, or is it? Uh... Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I don't have any. I don't have any secrets. Um, <laughs> it's about coal. It's about the history of coal yes. mining in Britain. And then the one after that I'm going to do is about the Civil War. Cool. And what what has attracted you to coal? Jerry, no one's to... no one's done it. It's an amazing story. You think you know all these guys going down holes in the ground, risking their lives in order to bring something as common or garden as coal to the surface in order to keep us warm. Which is amazing. Yeah, and it fueled, um, you know, it fueled the industrial revolution. It fueled all sorts of mechanical innovations, and it made it made it possible for people to read and write. How did it painful. make it possible for people to read and write? Because they could sit down in the warm and read a book. Okay, yeah, I see. <laughs> and they and then light, you know, gas light came from coal. Sure, of course, yeah. Well, I look forward to that. If you manage to not lose the rest, are you going to read? Are you going to do the audio book as well of that yourself? Yeah, you are a lazy bastard, aren't you? I like the audio books. <laughs> I, I like them. I've been lying in bed listening to you talk about yourself for the you last week. Sad <laughs> you poor man. Uh, it's been it's been terrible. I'm just. Uh, checking out there was so much to talk to you about you were in Bridget Jones film look at that that was pretty good 
Um, you've done quite. You've done little bits and pieces of acting as well, mainly as Jeremy Paxman. Yep. But uh, that's that's all good. And uh, yeah, no. Do you remember when I touched your briefcase with one of my hands in the lift? Do you remember? Oh that? yeah, I, I remember. I remember the hands. It was your right hand, wasn't it? <laughs> it was. Who was the most impressive person when you first went to the BBC and got in a lift? Who was the person that was? You're my. I did. The reason I say that is because we did in Fist of Fun, which was the first TV show I did. That was a joke I did about how impressed I was to see you in the lift. So that's why I'm doing that for the as a for joke. The fans, I, I see. Well, not as a joke. It was true, but I was also impressed. So, but it was me going. This is brilliant for Sue. I saw Jeremy Paxman in the lift. Um, who was the, who was your Jeremy Paxman when you first went to the BBC? Who did you see at the BBC and think, "Oh my goodness, I'm at the BBC," and there is Jimmy Saffle. <laughs> I once went to the loo with Peter Snow, in, and it was actually at ITN. Right, and he was standing next to me in the urinals, and I thought, "God, this is fantastic." <laughs> there you go. That's your. It's always with you. It always comes back to being in the toilet and pa- pants, pants. toilets. Yeah, very. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's all. I'm genitalia obsessed. You are. It all comes back. It's 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 pathetic. That's why. That's what boarding school does to her. To a man, I guess. I suppose that's. Have that, you got anything yeah, else to say? To. Uh, look, Jeremy, it's been uh, absolutely lovely to have you on the podcast. I'm glad we managed to make it work most of the time. And yes. uh, the technically, I hope it goes uh, better for you next time. No, I'm sure. I'm. It was. It was. I don't think it could go better. This is one of the. This is. This is in the top ten. It's going to be fine. All 177 uh, we, uh, viewers will will join your <laughs> view of that, I suppose. Well, we'll see. And then, you know, we'll know. We'll let you know. And do listen to Jeremy's podcast if you want to hear, like, short interviews with people in a pub. They're, like, 30 minutes long. It's a pretty good length for a podcast. Not an hour and 15 minutes like this one is. Um, yeah, this is far too long. Out. And the audio book the audiobook and the autobiography book are well worth your time as well. Yeah, there's a lot of great stuff in there. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we're back next week with Bride Reagan, I believe. Uh, but this week, give it up for the amazing Jerry Paxman. Thank you very much. Goodbye. How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>